Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, so, yep, I'm Pete Membroom from uh, ExpressVPN, and I'm really, really excited to get to talk to you guys um, about Lightway. Like, we've had a lot of um, discussions over the last few days. A lot of people through the booth has been really, really, really nice. Um, but I wanted to give uh, a chance to explain why we did this and the reasons behind it. And so, obvious question, why do we make Lightway, right? There were some very well-known protocols out there. Okay, we have OpenVPN, and of course we have the new and shiny WireGuard. So why did we go and create a new VPN protocol? Why didn't we just join and work with other open source projects? What was the reasoning for this? Well, OpenVPN has uh, a lot of pros to it, right? It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, it's been audited, it's well known, people would recognize the name, they'd understand it. Um, and for the longest time, it was our preferred protocol. Nothing wrong with that. The, the challenge though is OpenVPN was really created um, in a different era. Um, it was designed for the days when you know, your PC would be a box on a desk, you'd have a cable going to it, and that was pretty much as complicated as your networking environment got. And relatively speaking, speeds were much slower then. Right? The demands on a VPN were significantly less. Um, it expects to run as a binary. That might seem like an odd thing to point out, but if you wanted to get this into, say, an iOS app or you wanted to get it into an Android app, um, there was some uh, surgery involved, and it wasn't really designed with that in mind, understandably. And there's relatively limited ways to interact with it. If you want to control it as a binary, if you want to start, stop, um, and get status information from it, um, that's more difficult to do. Um, it does have some support for this, but you don't get full access. A lot of the time you would need to, for example, look at logs and stuff like that. Um, but of course, WireGuard. Why not WireGuard? Well, again, lots of pros for WireGuard. It's, you know, it's a super simple, simple implementation. It's super fast. It's very easy to set up. Uh, I think to say that it has a lot of momentum behind it would be, you know, would be selling it short. It has a lot of momentum. And there are some cons to it, though. And I should preface this by saying, when I talk about cons here, I mean them from the perspective of you know, ExpressVPN and what we're building and what we need out of a VPN. So with WireGuard, all your keys must be pre-shared among all your endpoints. Um, that's fine if you have you know, a small number of people that you're trying to hook this up to. When you have many thousands of servers and you have millions of clients connecting to it, um, pre-sharing keys is undesirable. Now, of course, you can build infrastructure to do this, but now you have to build and maintain the infrastructure um, and do all the work involved in looking after that. And well, that takes you away from actually focusing on the VPN part, which is the part where you're gonna be actually hopefully adding value. Um, the keys are also bound to IP addresses. That's kind of how you authorize keys to you know, connect through and use um, the VPN of WireGuard. And we're very privacy focused, right? We don't want to have, you know, this particular key is tied to this particular IP address. Um, of course, you know, the simplest way that you could pre-share all your keys would mean the same IP, the same key shared everywhere. Um, that's un undesirable for us because again, you know, it links those things too closely together. Could you make a system that does it um, differently so it's different per connection? Sure, absolutely, but now you need to build and maintain that as well. Um, they have, um, the WireGuard project has no interest in TCP support. Um, they list this uh, on the limitations page and they have a very good reason for it. Generally speaking, VPNs like TCP over TCP sucks. It's not a great day out, nobody likes it. it makes perfect sense they don't support it, but for us, we have a very, very large amount of users that are in um, using networks that don't have UDP. Think public government Wi-Fi. Think you know internet on a plane, coffee shops, um, you know businesses running the deep packet inspection, that sort of thing. In these environments, if you don't have UDP, it doesn't matter how great UDP is, you cannot use it. If you want to support those users, you must then provide a fallback, which, possibly ironically, is usually OpenVPN. Um, they also have um, no interest in DPI avoidance. 
um, their, their feeling is that, well, that should be done at a, at a different layer from the VPN. Um, they want to focus on the core VPN parts. Again, that makes perfect sense. Um, but for us, we have a lot of users in those sorts of environments where you know, they're, they're dealing with corporate firewalls, they're dealing with various different networking restrictions. And so for us, it, you know, we really need to have things like um, you know, obfuscation that's directly and easy to integrate into our protocol. Something that, um, like, uh, sorry, Wargo was interested in. So these are all things that, even if we put work and time and effort into them, uh, we tried to upstream them, uh, we wouldn't really have a receptive audience because we're just not building this the way that you know, they're looking for. So how do we make Lightway? Um, Lightway was built with a mobile first sign. So one of, you've probably heard this a lot with um, things like web design, but when we were putting this together, designing for uh, mobile or embedded systems first was really key for us. Um, we have a lot of people who are using um, low-powered Android devices or otherwise um, like embedded routers and things like that. Um, and mobile devices have a very different set of problems. They generally have limited power, they generally have limited CPU, and they have very interesting um, network configurations. One minute you're on Wi-Fi, then you're on to 5G, now you're back to 4G, back to 5G again. If you can handle these things nicely on mobile, when you then go to run this on, say, desktop, it's just going to work nicely for you. Trying to go the other way can be very complicated. So a guy called uh, Dieter Rams, I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of him. He was a big inspiration for Jonathan Ive at Apple. Um, I don't like reading off slides, but bear with me. I'm going to do it here. Uh, so everything interacts and is dependent on other things. We must think more thoroughly about what we are doing, how we are doing it, and why we're doing it. And that really was the main driving force for our work uh, on doing mobile first. How we balance all these different things um, together so that we get something that's very valuable and useful for people at the other end. And so that's really where we were going with the mobile design aspect, trying to keep all of these things in mind. Um, we'll touch on some more of these as we kind of go through, but that's the, the general gist and direction that we were taking. So, well, then what really is lightweight? We've got this far. We haven't really talked about it much, but um, this is actually a picture taken from uh, near my hometown, Plymouth. It's on Dartmoor. Um, it's to represent the, the blue sky, green fields approach that we were able to take. This is probably one of the only like three days you might have got a blue sky anywhere near my, my hometown. Um, anyone who's ever been on Dartmoor knows it's usually gray and miserable. So it took quite a while to find this. But basically, we had this rare opportunity. And it was, well, if we had a big enough magic wand, what would we do? Right? We have a lot of experience building and running these things. If none of the existing things are a good fit for us, what can we, what would we create instead? What if we could just pick something, what would it be? So one of the questions I get is, well, why not WireGuard? Why don't you like WireGuard? I love WireGuard. It's great. Um, I, I use it myself. And to say that Lightway was um, inspired by WireGuard is, is a very true statement. I think everyone will agree that when WireGuard first came out, like, it blew people's minds. No one really knew that VPNs could look like this. And it changed how people started viewing VPNs as a technology. Um, and so we really wanted that sort of stuff. There's lots in about WireGuard that we really, really wanted. However, it's also grounded very much by OpenVPN. We have over a decade of running a platform with OpenVPN. Uh, we like how the, the binary runs. We like how the, um, you know, the connections work, how authentication works, how network assignments work. There's a lot of stuff that we'd learned running this that we were really happy with and really wanted to keep. Um, one of the key things, um, Lightway is secured by Wolf SSL. Um, I won't go into too much of detail on the reasons why we picked it, but we did go through a whole host of different libraries before picking Wolf. But the key reason I mention it here is we did not roll our own crypto. So Wolf provides all the cryptography um, and the connection security for, for Lightway. None of that is implemented by us. Um, and Wolf themselves have actually verified and confirmed that the implementation that we've used and how we've used the library is, is uh, correct. And um, engineered by ExpressVPN. This I'm putting in there because we designed it to do very much what we wanted it to do. It's very opinionated. 
right? Like, like a lot of software, um, this was designed to solve our pain points. And chances are it will solve a lot of other people's pain points as well, but you know, this deliberately fixes problems that we cared about, um, and we designed it with that in mind. So Lightweight really is a mobile-first um, open-source VPN protocol. Um, it's open source under the uh, GPL v2. Um, it emphasizes simplicity, security, uh, privacy, and performance. That's really what we were trying to do with it. Um, so what does it offer? Well, it's fast. Um, realize that's a very iffy thing to give without numbers. Everything is relative. Um, but even in our basic builds, like we're clocking um, well over line speed for uh, gigabit connections. It's power efficient. Lightweight doesn't really do much of anything. If you're not passing traffic through it, Lightweight is basically um, inert and on purpose. Right? So things like sending heartbeats, by default, Lightweight doesn't do that because that would wake up um, your, your phone, that would draw battery, draw CPU, again, turns on the radio, more power, more CPU. We try to do um, as little as we possibly can there. And we're also using um, Wolf's hardware acceleration. So again, we're using less instructions um, and getting better power efficiency that way. Um, it has first class support for TCP. Again, for lots of people, this is an irrelevant feature. For us, it was absolutely critical. Uh, and so Lightway supports uh, TCP just as well as it does UDP. Um, it was designed to support easy extension. Um, this is so that you can easily add things around the tunnel and also things for through the tunnel. Um, and this is because doing that with OpenVPN is quite difficult. You're not supposed to do that. Um, but it's something that I need to do um, in my role. So I wanted to make sure that it was simple to extend. Um, it has a very simple code base. The first uh, version we released um, publicly under the GPL was um, just under 2,000 lines of code. So it's quite a simple code base. People say, oh, you know, the wire code base is so simple, you could audit it yourself in a few days. Well, Lightway is so simple, you could probably audit it you know, on, on a live YouTube stream. Like, it's really that simple. And most of it is um, you know, getting and setting in terms of um, the code itself. A big focus um, on privacy and you know, the ideals there, so the ability to like, um, mask IP addresses from the client itself. Um, this means that if you did have someone looking over someone's shoulder or looking at log files and things like that, you wouldn't really have to be concerned about trying to obfuscate it because the IP address doesn't actually have any real identification value. Everyone else on that system would have the same one. Um, so where's Lightweight today? Um, it's been around three years carrying real-world traffic. Um, over four, it protects around four million people around the world. So far this year, it's handled over uh, 11 billion uh, individual connections. Um, we've transferred, on average, you know, just over like an exabyte of traffic so far. Um, also, it's in, uh, independently audited by Cure53. So once when we open sourced it and went live, um, and again, quite recently. So again, we're keeping up the, the public auditing of the protocol. And this is just a, a very quick comparison to OpenVPN. And again, this is because this is what we were running. Um, and these values are relative. But if you've ever tried doing speed tests or performance testing, uh, you know as well as I do that just spewing out numbers is not particularly helpful. But compared to users who had been, you know, using OpenVPN, um, you know, people were experiencing like twice as fast uh, connection times. Uh, reliability was improved by 40%, so connections were longer lived. Um, and we were basically seeing double speeds um, on average across um, all users. Um, so for Lightweight Tomorrow, well, what currently is written in ANSI-C, we are making a big push to move this to Rust. Um, somebody's happy. Um, and this is for all the reasons that you can probably imagine. Um, three years ago when I you know, put this down, um, we were looking to support, again, those really embedded um, niche devices. And the Rust compiler wasn't there yet. It just wasn't going to do the job. That's no longer the case. And I think most of you probably will know that Rust has moved on massively in three years. Um, we are very excited about taking advantage of things like the memory safety, the borrow checker, the performance, the much simpler code, a modern tool chain and things like hash maps being available out of the box is you know, quite a nice thing too. Um, we're also moving quickly to implement the post-quantum protection. Um, this is something that's been you know, talked about a lot quite recently. Um, it was a big topic of the real world crypto conference a couple of weeks ago. 
And to do with right now, we're seeing this um, save now, decrypt later that even large companies are now doing, with the idea being that in about 10, 15 years, quantum computing will be at the stage where they can basically just unzip um, the encrypted data that, that they're storing today. Um, I'm going to more deals later in the Q&A if anyone's interested, but the short version is the post-quantum protection that we're looking to roll out um, will help protect against that particular threat. Um, also, we're improving open source reference clients. We have one right now. It's not great. Um, it did the job, but it's not uh, something that people would generally be able to run as their own um, server, their own client. Um, we're revamping and improving that so that you can use it um, ultimately as a drop-in replacement for OpenVPN. We're hoping to get it uh, packaged into uh, distributions and things like that. Um, and lastly, your community outreach and engagement. Um, part of the reason why I'm here today, um, why we've been here the last few days, just to try and engage more with the community, figure out new things that we can do with this and new ideas and how we can uh, make it more useful to, to more people. Um, if you're interested in some of the stuff that uh, we're coming, that's coming up next, um, do have a, a Google form that you can fill in. It's just uh, an email address so we can contact you and just let you know, hey, here's where we're going. Um, we're still trying to figure out the best way of doing that. So rather than trying to figure that out in a rush and get it horribly, horribly wrong, we have something simple to kind of get us started. Um, again, the usuals, our social channels. Um, if you are interested, you know, please feel free to check us out anywhere there. And um, thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, if you want to start getting set up, uh, yeah, we're going to do questions, but you can start getting set up in the meantime. So, questions, Roland? Uh, the, the TCP over TCP problem. Are you, you mentioned uh, uniform IP addresses visible from the client. Are you doing termination in the client so you can avoid the, the, the robbers and fallback? To avoid the what, sorry? The, the, the performance collapse for TCP over TCP when you have a drop packet. Um, based on the stuff that we've been doing, we very rarely see um, you know, TCP meltdown scenarios these days. Um, it's most common when you're on either a very poor network or you're like on the edge of Wi-Fi and you get a significant number of drops. Um, normally, this cleans itself up quite nicely. Um, and compared to trying to have a workaround as opposed to just leaving it be and not using TCP at all. Like so far, we very rarely see this um, in the field. Um, some of the stuff that we are doing to um, improve this is just having um, timeouts based in Lightway itself so that it knows when it's trying to send traffic, if it isn't getting a response or you're not able to read from that socket after a period of time, um, it can effectively do like a, like, a, like a dead man switch and just reset that connection. Uh, usually due to how the, those, what triggers those events, it's usually when it's um, you know, in your pocket and not you know, being interacted with. So usually when those things would happen anyway, you wouldn't be like, aware of it. It wouldn't be happening just as you were typing something, for example. Um, there's definitely things we can do to improve it, but so far it's not posed much of a problem. I wanted to ask, uh, do we need to use ExpressVPN itself to, use, to utilize Lightway? Do we need to use ExpressVPN itself to use uh, utilize Lightway? Can, uh, for example, OpenVPN and WireGuard offer their own servers so we can set up in our, uh, our yep. servers? Uh, so how can we use Lightway? So Lightway, as in the core protocol, um, it's on GitHub. It's fully open source. You can use it for anything. Um, that is the core library. So that's been designed specifically to remove any mention like TCP, UDP, and stuff like that. So you can hook it up in any way you can imagine to whatever you want. Um, the most fun one we've talked about so far is um, doing lightweight over Google Sheets. So you don't actually have to use TCP or UDP. You can stick it over a spreadsheet if you want. Your performance would not be great, and I, you wouldn't be streaming anything, but you could build that connectivity. Um, to answer your question more directly, we do have a very basic reference client, as I alluded to earlier, um, and that's being improved now. So over the next um, few months to the end of the year, we're looking to release um, better reference clients that are improved that you could use as your own server. So you do not need to be an ExpressVPN customer to use Lightway. Um, 
you can go and take the library now and, and build stuff with it, um, but soon there will be um, better suited clients so you can actually use it as like an open VPN replacement. Questions. So, uh, is there any tentative date or any specific line that you are working with in the open source domain, which uh, which has like a promising deadline or a date around which we can expect something that we can use on our own servers? So, can you say that first bit again? Uh, is there any open source client which is like closely working with you so that I can like expect a data on which we can try uh, try deploying this on our own servers to test it out? Um, we do have a lot of people at Express who are very um, engaged with the open source community. Um, I think we have a couple who are Debian maintainers. We have a couple who uh, do a lot of work at OpenWRT. Um, as part of the new like validation and testing for the new work we're doing with Rust, um, that's what's going to cause these new clients to be created and released. Um, but they'll be released as part of um, you know, the, the Rust rework effectively. Um, at that point, we are be looking to work with any open source distribution that wants to help and work with us. Um, and we'll be openly trying to help, uh, like for example, ensure that we're, we're able to package it in the right way. So we're looking to work with um, distributions to try and get it out there. Um, so at least initially, you'd just be able to download it either from the crate um, or potentially our site. Um, but we are actively looking to work with people to get it integrated into, into distribution so others can use it. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, thanks for your presentation, Pete. Um, do you, could you speak more to the post uh, quantum protection part that you're talking about, maybe? Do you have an, maybe a framework, an idea in mind that, that, that you're working on, that you're exploring? Could you maybe speak a little bit more to that? Sure. So one of the really nice benefits of using um, Wolf SSL as our library is Wolf SSL has already integrated um, post-quantum support um, as part of like the LibOQS project. So for us, actually enabling um, post-quantum security is effectively you know, tweaking the configuration of Wolf and then rebuilding. Um, so we don't actually have to do anything particularly special for that. We don't have to implement new protocols or, or new layers. Um, we're just going to take what's already there that someone else has already designed, tested, and certified, and we're going to use that. Um, we try to have any, anything crypto related, that's kind of how we approach it. Like, we try to do it hands off. Um, did you, do you want to know more about the actual issue, or you're, you're, you're cool with the issue and just want to know the, the framework? Okay, so we're just going to be using. Um, so if you go to um, our GitHub page, we, we create a, um, a system level wrapper for Wolf SSL already. So Wolf SSL dash sys, um, it's a Rust crate for Wolf SSL. We have already integrated the post quantum feature into that. Um, so anyone can pull that uh, crate, set that feature, and they'll have access to um, Wolf SSL in Rust with the post quantum stuff enabled. Um, we're currently working on adding the high level wrapper around it so that you can more easily use it with things like Tokyo, but the core stuff is already there and, and it's already open for people to look at and, and see it working. Cool. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, how do you handle expiry of SSL cert for this? And the second one is about, what was the in inspiration of WireGuard that you, know, you say uh, this sure. is taking from? Thanks. Um, so Lightweight itself doesn't really do anything specific with the SSL certs. Um, it just uses whichever SSL certs that you provide it. So you can get those from any provider um, or your own CA if you want. Um, so again, we use, um, you can indeed use Let's Encrypt. Um, so we're using, again, another benefit of using Wolf SSL, like standard off the shelf certs just work out of the box. So there's no restriction on, on how you create those or how you use them. Um, as long as you have in the client uh, the CA so that it can recognize the server, um, you know, there's nothing you need to do that's special for that. Um, in terms of inspiration, um, I think WireGuard was super inspiring for a whole host of reasons. Um, until then, like VPNs were always kind of like clunky. You always expected them to impact how you use your connection. It's going to get slower, latency was going to go up. 
you know, this was just something that we kind of just assumed and expected would happen with all VPNs. And I think what WireGuard showed was that you know, what, you know, they can be lightweight and still be secure, and they can be really, really fast. Um, in many cases, we've seen um, with lightweight that actually improves internet connection performance. Um, particularly, obviously, this is testing through our service, and our servers have like, awesome connectivity. So, you know, rather than going through your, what your ISP provides, particularly for international long haul stuff, um, by hopping into us, like you get access to that bandwidth. So, what would traditionally be a case of please use our, our, our VPN, it's not that bad. Now it's actually like we can improve quality of, of experience. Um, the other way like we can do this for you is with its, um, like it can roam between um, Wi-Fi and, and cell. So when you're, um, you know, when if you are doing, say, um, a speed test and you're on Wi-Fi and you just turn Wi-Fi off and you drop back to cell, um, your speed test will continue. Um, it'll, it'll drop or change, of course, but your connection itself won't drop and your traffic won't be exposed. Um, and we found this can actually be really helpful even going in and out of elevators and things like that when you're, you know, when you get that WhatsApp call and you get in the elevator and like, I've just lost it for a second. When you come out, of course, you're usually waiting a few more seconds for it to realize that, you know, the network is back, the 3G's come back or 4G's come back and, you know, trying things to catch up. Um, with Lightweight, because it's keeping the network stack kind of alive and it very quickly recovers, um, usually the um, poor connectivity features in the stuff that runs on top of it, uh, they never need to kick in. And so you tend to get faster responses for things like, again, if you're running Grab or you're running Uber or something like that, um, you do tend to see more um, faster recovery, basically. More questions? Uh, I have a general ExoVPN question, I think specific about Lightweight. So, I'm sure. Yeah, so uh, ExoVPN recently pulled out of India. There, there are no Indian servers from what I can recall, I, the last news I read. Uh, because, so how are you dealing with situations where more and more governments are having more regulations to control the VPN usage of the citizens? Uh, yeah. Sure. And, we do, um, you, and uh, I have a specific use case where I need an Indian server and ExpressVPN doesn't have it anymore from what I know. So, how are you dealing around that? Uh, for the situation, so, because I couldn't use uh, any other VPNs, I had to like I set up my own VPN server on an Indian Indian instance, and then I am using that. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. Um, That's okay. So the India case was quite interesting. Um, as soon as the Indian government said that we are going to put these restrictions in place, um, we immediately pulled all of our servers. Um, from the region. Um, whilst it's important for us to have servers there to represent people who need, you know, want to use it there, um, like privacy is our thing and we will not compromise on that. So as soon as there was any kind of hint there might be some issues, we just pulled out of it straight away uh, and we were the first to do so. Um, however, what we do have for India, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we do have what we call virtual clusters. Again, we're quite open about these um, and these are are clusters that you can connect to that will give you like the geolocation of India. So for a lot of um, like connectivity issues that you might have where you need to be in India with like an Indian IP address, um, the virtual clusters can be um, quite beneficial for you. So if you haven't tried that, give that a go. Um, but yeah, again, like we are we are maybe a company, but we're a law abiding company, so we make sure that we don't get into any of these sort of sticky situations. If we start seeing more cases of this, we will do the same thing. We will pull our servers out. Um, we don't compromise on our privacy or how we build our service. Thank you. So uh, I have a question about the actual cryptographic protocol you guys are using. So I just skimmed your, your uh, reports from Cure53. Uh, um, it seems to be that you're just using TLS uh, because you mentioned that you use both TLS, so you just actually use the TLS protocol, pack all the network, network in the, into the TLS tunnel and, and, and use that instead of like WireGuard, they have their own custom protocol. Yep, yep. so for the, um, the TCP side of things, we just use plain vanilla TLS 1.3. And the reason for that is it works really well, um, and we haven't found any reason to change it. For uh, UDP, we are still using DTLS 1.2. Um, we have certain extensions 
that were added to that um, from the TLS spec to give us a better key renegotiation. Um, but we're already working with Wolf to upgrade us to um, DTS 1.3. Um, that will also then give us the post-quantum um, support as well on both the uh, TCP and the UDP side. Yeah, okay, this was wrong about so the, the, the PQC will be just using the TLS FL suits that, that you said. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So with DTLS, we'll, once we move to DLS 1.3, we just get all the benefits of, of the TLS stuff, and then we'll just use the standard off-the-shelf stuff again. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, any any more questions? No more questions. All right. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.